Hi, I'm Arthur Ismailov from University of Toronto, and my group we study geometric phase effects in conical intersection dynamics. So, we prepared a series of videos where I talk about uh, our recent progress in that field, our recent studies, how geometric phase effects uh, appear in uh, non adiabatic dynamics, how do they alter non adiabatic dynamics. And uh, this is the first video where I would like to give some background on geometric phase effects. To start, let's uh, consider some uh, historical background. In 1960, by Longy Higgins, and uh, later in 1980, Michael Berry uh, kind of generalized uh, some of the ideas Longy Higgins found for the molecular systems, uh, for more general physical systems. So, but the idea of the geometric phase is uh, very simple. If we say have a uh, total time independent Schrodinger equation uh, with a wave function of, that contains uh, coordinates of electrons, small r, and the coordinates of nuclei, big R, right? Then if we uh, switch to adiabatic representation where we have uh, this um, product ansatz with electronic functions and nuclear functions, then the electronic functions are obtained as a solution of electronic Hamiltonian eigenvalue problem, right? And the nuclear uh, variables are considered as parameters in this problem. So they are not variables and they are fixed for every uh, solution for at every point, right? Mm -hmm. So what Michael Berry and Longy Higgins uh, showed that if you just study parametrical dependence of uh, these electronic functions, they are quite interesting uh, depending on whether this uh, parametric dependence encircles the areas where eigenvalues of the electronic problem are degenerate or not. So in case where we have, say, one electronic state that is separated or one eigenvalue that is separated from all others, that in the molecular problems would be a potential energy surface, right? So then when we uh, go around some circle and uh, consider the electronic wave function, it will be exactly the same wave function when we return back to the uh, initial position. Now, if we encircle, on the other hand, uh, the degeneracy point, then the electronic wave function will change the sign, right? So that's what uh, been written in the Longy Higgins paper, and Michael Berry did it for a general case where it's not only really about molecules, but rather about any parametric dependence of uh, electronic or any other function, right? So now, uh, first, I would like to address how this is this this experiment can be really done for the molecular problems because when you read this, it's not really clear how do you do this adiabatic uh, parametric uh, evolution of the electronic function, right? That is described in their papers. Now, how can, how can we see this? Um, by How can we do this in numerical experiment? Now, let me point out that there is a gauge freedom in the electronic uh, eigenvalue problem. In other words, if we have electronic wave function, that is an eigenfunction of this electronic uh, equation, then we can put any phase that can depend on the nuclear coordinates. And that will not alter the fact that this electronic function is an eigenfunction. And the eigenvalue for all classes of, sort of these functions will be exactly the same. Now, the question naturally arises, who is choosing this uh, phase factor when we solve any eigenvalue problem that has parameters in it, right? So the answer is very simple. Computer programs do uh, this for us. And in order to really uh, see what uh, Michael Berry and uh, Longy Higgins are talking about, we need to actually uh, get back this uh, phase freedom and uh, closely monitor what the phase is that is chosen uh, by computer program. All right. So, to, in other words, to take back the control over the phase, what uh, and connect the points on the on that circle, what we need to do is actually maximize the overlap. Here, the overlap means the integration over the electronic variables 
for adjacent points uh, in the nuclear geometry. So if you do the electronic structure calculation, then you obtain this electronic function in one point of the geometry and then in another. And uh, in order to make this wave function to change the sign at the end, what you need to do is to choose the phase of the next point, right? Uh, consistently with the phase that is already chosen for the first point, right? So if you maximize this overlap to be close to one instead of minus one, because usually it's a real arithmetics we use in electronic structure codes, then uh, the phase of this function will be consistent with the phase of the next function and the next function will know about the previous one, all right? And then we can go along this circle and see really that if we uh, encircle the degeneracy, then the wave function will change the sign. Okay, so one way to well, kind of think about this is that it's like moving on the Möbius strip, where since it's a single surface um, manifold, if we start on the upper uh, surface, then going around, we actually end up with a uh, rotated away kind of wave function uh, pointing downward. Okay. And uh, more than that, electronic functions become the double valued function of the nuclear um, coordinates, right? And uh, you may uh, wonder at this point that uh, how, this, how this is actually happening because quantum mechanics tells us in the uh, almost the first uh, few lectures that uh, actually wave function must be a single valued object. That's one of the postulates of uh, quantum mechanics, right? Now, <coughs> let me remind you that uh, so far we were, we've been looking at the uh, electronic wave function and the total electron nuclear wave function that corresponds to actual physical system, molecule in this case, right? It, uh, that's the function that uh, is real and uh, that's the function that must be single valued uh, according to the postulates of quantum mechanics. Therefore, in order to make this function single valued, it's uh, quite simple actually. We need to make a, we need to compensate double valuedness of electronic function by the double valuedness of the nuclear wave function that is also present in this ansatz. Now, this exactly means that we, we need to impose double valued boundary conditions on the, our nuclear wave function, okay? Now, of course, the question arises, what if we ignore this uh, complication because uh, it is com more complicated to impose the double valued boundary conditions on the nuclear wave function as we will see in a moment. And uh, the answer to that question, what if we ignore, is the following. We again have two parts. The electronic problem will be fine because we have this gauge freedom so we can put any phase in front of the electronic wave function and uh, whether it's double valued or not double valued function of parameters uh, doesn't really change the fact that uh, it's an eigenvalue, uh, well, it's eigen uh, function of this problem and uh, it has a certain eigenvalue which will not be changed by the, uh, this presence of double valuedness or absence of it, right? So all properties which are local in R will not uh, actually see any difference. And uh, that's what happens in electronic structure codes where um, the phase of the electronic wave function is fixed by some criterion. And one of them, uh, like quite common, uh, is that just uh, you have, if you have a Slater uh, determinant expansion, then we, um, we have one determinant that has the largest contribution and we just make sure that the coefficient in front of it is positive and that's the uh, way to fix the overall phase of the function, then all other coefficients will be uh, adjusted correspondingly, right? Now, but if we look at the nuclear problem, and uh, just for a change, uh, let's, let's consider the time-dependent uh, nuclear problem. Uh, that means that the total wave function is time-dependent, we're solving the time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation. Then, since we found these uh, electronic functions from the electronic part, then we can say for this simple example I, I put here is a two-state problem. We have two electronic states and if we project on those states 
then the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the uh, nuclear part will, will be like this, where we have a potential part, diagonal in adiabatic representation, and then the kinetic part, which uh, is somewhat complicated in adiabatic representation. That's the price we pay for the simplicity of the potential part. Now, if we look at the kinetic energy uh, component of this equation, it has so-called non-adiabatic coupling terms that uh, differentiate uh, electronic wave functions, phi's, with respect to nuclear coordinates. These nabla operators, they are coming from the kinetic energy terms, acting on their electronic functions and differentiating them with respect to nuclei, right? Now, for this time-dependent nuclear equation, we have two conditions uh, for a well, successful um, solvent procedure, right? So first is that uh, since we have these elements, we need to choose the electronic wave function uh, phases, nuclear phases, uh, in a continuous uh, way. So that's the same procedure as I was describing before to show that they're changing the sign. You need to connect uh, well the adjacent points with the con uh, with the continuous uh, choice of the phase, right? Otherwise, you won't be able to differentiate uh, these uh, wave functions with respect to nuclei, right? First and second order differentiation is uh, necessary here. Now, but this is only one condition. The second condition to solve this equation properly is that we need to impose the double valued boundary condition on chi's since they are part of their, our adiabatic ansatz, right? And since this is a global function of the nuclear geometry at every time step, uh, then we need to allow them to be double valued. Otherwise, the solution will not be proper, okay? All right, so how do we account for the geometric phase in this problem? It's uh, somewhat complicated to put the double-valued boundary conditions, and that's why uh, it's easier from the numerical perspective uh, that uh, is necessary thing to do for uh, well, analysis in these systems, uh, is to work with the still single-valued functions. Luckily, uh, back in the 80s, uh, Alden Mead and Don Trular suggested a, a very useful trick to avoid the double-valued uh, functions. And that trick is to introduce the resolution of identity into this product ansatz. And that resolution of identity is consists of two, two exponents with the opposite signs of theta function that is made the way that uh, allows the theta function to change uh, from 0 to pi when we encircle the point of the degeneracy. Of course, it's a, a question on its own how to build such theta functions, but imagine if we can build such functions, then uh, they would compensate uh, the double-valued um, character of chi and phi functions uh, when we put these theta functions in the exponents, because the exponent uh, of i theta will change from 1 to minus 1 when theta goes from 0 to pi. And then our new function phi prime and chi prime will be a single valued function. So, and if we work in their uh, well, basis, then uh, no problem with double valued boundary conditions will be encountered. Now, theta functions can be also organized in a slightly different way. Uh, there is actually some degree of freedom here, is that the theta must only change between 0 and some odd number of pi's. That will uh, do the trick. Uh, so there is some gauge freedom in the definition of the theta, but not full freedom. So the theta must be still defined in a one, some rigorous way so that it changes between 0 and uh, odd number of pi's. Now, in order to uh, do further analysis and actually see how the geometric phase effects uh, well, alter the dynamics, for example, it is somewhat useful to actually keep working in the uh, basis of uh, original functions, uh, because then uh, if we account for these theta exp uh, exponents, 
then the geometric phase effects will be uh, included. And if we won't account for them, then the geometric phase effects will be excluded because when we work with original functions, we do not account for the double valuedness in the normal numerical procedures. Right? So now, how does this work? It works from, through so-called long derivatives because the terms that uh, are affected by these uh, exponents are the kinetic energy terms arising from the uh, momentum operator. So the regular momentum operator in the nuclear problem is differentiation with respect to nuclear coordinates. Right? And then when we uh, consider now the functions, uh, the electronic functions that have this extra exponential terms, then when we uh, obtain the momentum operator for our chi functions, uh, then this extra exponents from the electronic functions modify the momentum operator for the uh, nuclear chi functions, right? And uh, they provide some extra terms, uh, nabla theta here, while also giving the regular momentum operator. So now, in order to switch on and off geometric phase effects in our consideration, we can just uh, add this nabla theta term or remove them from the nuclear Schrodinger equation for the uh, chi terms. Okay. Of course, our study is not the first on the geometric phase effects because the geometric phase effects have been known for quite a while. And uh, there have been very many, I would say, studies uh, for different molecular systems where uh, this gentleman tried to uh, analyze whether the geometric phase effects uh, modify some uh, molecular dynamics quantities. And it was found that uh, in some cases uh, they uh, change quite substantially the some molecular dynamic quantities and in some cases they are quite negligible. So we were interested in really understanding on maybe uh, of uh, systems of our interest which are for the chemical dynamics of mid-sized molecules, when exactly the geometric phase effects are important and how can we really, maybe without doing the numerical simulations uh, of the nuclear dynamics, understand when these uh, effects will be important and uh, when they can be ignored. Okay? So in order to uh, investigate the geometric phase effects uh, in uh, the setup that is the most convenient for that and see where they are important, uh, we decided to go with a very simple, uh, probably the simplest possible uh, scenario and uh, consider the model system, two-state, two-dimensional model, starting with diabatic model of, the, of uh, conical intersection where uh, we have two paraboloids, two-dimensional, and they have uh, these two paraboloids, they uh, can be separated in energy uh, and also configurational space by these shifts. And also they have uh, linear coupling that gives rise uh, when you diagonalize uh, the diabatic uh, potential matrix to the conical intersection in the adiabatic representation. So uh, the reason we have this diabatic model is that uh, in order to obtain, uh, according to the mid and truller uh, recipe, the theta angle, it's very convenient to have a diabatic model. Okay? And in diabatic model, uh, there are no actually the problems with the double uh, valued wave function. All the functions, electronic and nuclei, can be considered as a single valued, and the dynamics will be still exact. Okay? That's why it's uh, very convenient to work with diabatic model. Now, diabatic to adiabatic transformation is exact, and that's another reason to start with diabatic model, because if we start with adiabatic model, generally it's not uh, possible to go to the uh, diabatic representation. And uh, since we're working with models, all the quantities are analytical, and uh, we can uh, analyze things uh, not just using numerical simulations, but rather 
see how the terms uh, interact in the Hamiltonian and uh, obtain the well, just uh, analytical expressions uh, by uh, analyzing them. Uh, then uh, the last but not least is this 2D analytical model actually and its dynamics can be uh, related to the realistic dynamics of 3 and minus 6 dimensional systems. And that analysis is uh, somewhat uh, complicated and uh, the details are given in this uh, paper we published uh, quite recently. But uh, believe me, this, uh, this can be done and that's why 2D analysis is uh, very uh, important for the understanding of uh, dynamics of real uh, systems. With that, uh, let me just emphasize that uh, the questions we will be addressing in our uh, next videos are how geometric phase effects will modify dynamics and we'll do it uh, starting with this simple model I just show you and then we will see what, is, what are the parameters for this model where the geometric phase effects can be ignored and when are they important. So just by then analyzing the parameters uh, from the say electronic structure calculations, then we can tell a lot without actually doing the nuclear dynamics. And then the third question, which we also quite interested in is how geometric phase effects can be included in the realistic calculations, uh, which are usually done on the in the on the fly way and uh, both in the quantum uh, case and quantum classical case. So those will be the questions and uh, uh, I'll see you in the next videos.